You can be a great leader and you can be a great teacher, but the question is, can you be both a great leader and teacher? Until I met Catalina Sainez, I wasn't sure that was possible. I'm telling you right now, Catalina is the real deal. As a parent, you want to meet a leader and teacher who can talk the talk and walk the walk. When she says she cares for your, you and your child, she means it and can teach math like no other. Today is part four in a five-part mini-series with LA Catholic school leaders. Our topic today, three ways Catholic teachers show love. Catalina herself attended public school through middle school and then headed on to boarding school and traveled all the way back east to attend Wellesley College and later Harvard School of Education. When I say she has experienced every type of education, I mean it. In this episode, you will learn about Cat Catalina's own educational journey and why she chose to put her own children in Catholic schools. As a teacher, principal, and parent, she knows exactly what it means to educate the whole child while also simply showing love and care to each individual student. If you're not yet convinced that Catholic schools are a good option for you, this episode is for you. If you're looking to validate your decision on choosing a Catholic school, this episode is definitely for you. And if you just get excited when listening to quality educators and leaders, well, hello, this episode is for you and was for me too. <sighs> Grab your tea or coffee or beverage of choice. Sit back because you're going to enjoy this episode. You're listening to Destination University, a podcast for college-bound teens and the parents, mentors, and educators who support them. If that is you, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Welcome to our special mini series with LA Catholic Schools. With over 250 schools in Santa Barbara, Ventura and Los Angeles County, it is the largest Catholic school district in the country. Today, we are specifically talking about teachers, mentors and coaches and all champions of students. All parents, ultimately what you're looking for are two things for your child. The first is to give them a great education and the second, is to ensure your child's happiness, that they lead a happy life and they have a happy future. Well, today we are joined with Principal Catalina Sainz at Resurrection Catholic School in Boyle Heights. She's going to share with you how our Catholic schools can play a pivotal role in your child's happiness. The elementary schools of LA Archdiocese serve over 40,000 families. And in the entire LA Catholic School District, they serve over 80,000 families. So if you've been thinking about a new school choice for your child, this episode is for you. If you're not Catholic, but curious about what Catholic education means and what it looks like, stick around, this show is for you. And if you want your child to have a community of supporters and believers, and dare I say cheerleaders, this show is definitely for you. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Cynthia Colon, your host today for Destination University. We explore extraordinary people who lived ordinary childhoods and found a pathway to college. Being here today makes you a rock star, just like Catalina. So congratulations and welcome. Whew. Well, hello Catalina, how are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. I'm just honored to be here, Dr. Colon, so much to share, especially about our Catholic schools. I'm just so excited. Oh my gosh, we were chatting, uh, listeners and watchers, you, we were chatting before and sort of understanding um, how our paths maybe have probably crossed somewhere along the way, right? Mm -hmm. But Catalina, you have such a rich uh, history and experience. I wonder if you don't mind sharing some of that what you were sharing. Where did you grow up? I know it was in LA and sort of your pathway to getting where you are today. Yes, and I would love to share that because I think it'll put some context into what I see in the value of our Catholic schools because I actually have been in different uh, systems. Uh, so I grew up in, uh, I mean, I was born in LA, went to actually Mexico City, came back in sixth grade 
went to the neighborhood schools, uh, uh, public schools. Then my teacher, one of my teachers really was uh, amazing. I ended up in a boarding school in Ojai, California. From there went to Wellesley College back east, you know, uh, and then here's where the, the experience gets started. I come back from Wellesley. I always wanted to teach since I was in sixth grade. I thought that when I became a teacher as a Latina, I was gonna be on top of the world. And in Mexico, teachers are seen in a very different light that they're often seen here. So I came with that background. Being a teacher was like a profesora, you know? And so very excited, you know, started my career at Resurrection School in 1999. And I, fell in love with teaching even more. Everybody told me it was going to be easy. I was like, this is hard. And, you know, for us that have that calling of not just being a teacher, but Catholic school teachers are not just a, have a calling for teaching, but they have a, a calling for being Catholic and really being a steward of the discipleness piece. And so really just fell in love with that and really thinking about how do we really help our community reach, uh, you know, this uh, reach more than we often do um, by beating the odds and really thinking about the whole child the way Catholic schools are and and were before and are currently doing now especially now in the way that our community is so divided you know so much of that is needed so after resurrection I went back east to work more with charter schools because there were so many families that couldn't afford the charter schools at the time I mean the Catholic schools at the time that you know part of charter school movement became that bringing the whole child into the, the education of the students. And so when worked in charter schools for a while, then ended up at Harvard Graduate School of Education to get my master's in school leadership. Ended up back with my ch children now at that time, you know, a couple of years later with children in my own time. I'm like, where am I going to send them to school? Well, I was going to be a Catholic school because I had already witnessed you know, the private, the public, and I chose Catholic schools very specifically for what they offer in the, in the commitment of teachers and staff there. And also I've seen it in, in the charter schools that I worked, um, even charter schools as they develop, you know, they, they have a harder time because they don't have this faith component in there. Um, and I remember very specifically that, you know, so I've been just a little more, I've been from charter school to resurrection, charter school world, to resurrection. You know, I work two years in, in charter schools, come back three or four years of resurrection. It, uh, something, God always pulls me back to resurrection <laughs> until this last time, just finishing off my fourth year as a principal there. But here's what I see. Let me tell you the story. Even myself as an administrator and teacher in a, in a, in a charter school, the last charter school that I was working at, you know, students were, you know, there was a student having a really hard time and really acting out, really acting out. And I remember at that time, I still had very strong relationships with the parent. <clears throat> and nobody could control this one child. And I remember tapping him on the shoulder and saying, you know, you're going to be okay. We're going to, I have to, well, let's pray on it. Just, just pray, you're gonna be okay. And he got so, and I forgot because I'm being going back and forth from charter school to Catholic school that I forgot that I was no longer in a Catholic school. And I told the child, it's okay, we're gonna pray on it. You're gonna be okay. And he got shocked that I even brought God into the whole situation that he started crying. He was in tears. I think like in, in, all, his, in all his angst and, angst and anger, the fact that I brought in the faith piece just, just threw him off and calmed him down. You know, that, we, that I care more for him than just a child that was gonna sit there and do some math problems, that I cared about his whole, his whole being and well being, just in, in, in the way that I brought faith in. That I remember one teacher later told me, you know, we don't really talk about faith here. And I think that's for me the biggest difference of being going then back to Catholic school and probably never going back, <laughs> uh, back and forth. I think like that's what we bring. We bring something like the other half of the picture that is missing in many of our public school system. The part where you care not just about the academic growth. And I see that in every teacher I meet in the schools, in, in my school and other Catholic schools. We care for the development of children's hearts. We care that they are kind. 
We care that they are loving. We care that they're inclusive. We care that we care that they develop a sense of others and that when they take care of their community, they're taking care of themselves and their future. That is the difference. That's what our faith brings in the school. And that's what our teachers bring in everything that they do. Because when some, our teachers can hold their children's hand when they're struggling and pray with them, pray with them. And the power of that is something that is amazing to see day in, day out. When there's a struggle, everybody knows we're going to find a solution because we have something bigger than ourselves guiding our steps. And that is our faith. Um, so I say that because I always, you know, it's, it's hard for people to understand, given my background, why I keep coming back to Catholic schools, you know, and I, and I just, there's really something so valuable in them that more and more people out there need to know and find out about this, this valuable tool that we have to really prepare this young children of tomorrow who are going to lead our world, who's currently divisive. So you wanna know how we're gonna create that part where people actually care for each other and care to listen to each other, even though they have big differences, this is it, our Catholic schools, because our teachers focus on those things. Well, what I find most interesting, and th those of you who are just catching up here, get your you know pen and paper, take notes, there's golden nuggets, Catalina just dropped a bunch. What I find so interesting about what you just said is you yourself have, have experienced the range of uh, educational systems. So public schools, charter schools, private schools, and I'm not sure if you caught it listeners, she herself said she went to a boarding school, one of the top boarding schools in California, dare I say, across the country, and was has been exposed, but she keeps getting pulled back and pulled back or drawn or called to whatever label you want to put on it, called back to serve the Catholic school, the Catholic school community at resurrection. Yes. And I love what you said about the young boy. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you were written up for it by for praying, <laughs> taking a moment to pray, but there's a, there's a certain calmness. Uh, I didn't go to Catholic school as a child myself, but I, I later worked in the LA uh, Catholic school district like you at high schools. And there, you're right. There was something about taking a moment to, we would pray in the morning and, and we pray, we'd have, you know, mass maybe once a week or once every week. And, and there's something about centering, feeling centered and like you can breathe. So whew, now you said you, you chose Catholic schools for your own children. Um, yes, I did. Okay. So take us. Okay. So speak to us as a, as a parent, um, you know, we, now the time was, the time was, had come and now you're thinking, I got to choose what's right for my own kids. And it's very different, right? Being a, an educator, whatever yeah. type of school you work at, but when it comes to your own kids, you had to do what was right for you. So talk to us like as, as a parent. And then afterwards, we'll, I'll get you to share some stories about your you know, teachers and people. Yeah. Well, actually my story, it relates back to the teachers that were there. So when I was there first in 1999, I was there as a math teacher, my mentor, uh, Miss Alice Constantino was a math teacher. And by the way, I was a math major and I've been a math teacher too. <laughs> so she, I, of course her mentorship and, um, but what I saw was just the relationships that were built and that I, how many times I saw uh, her students, even there as a first year teacher coming back to her after they graduate or inviting her to the quinceañeras, inviting her to all of those things, you know, and I, I, uh, there's something amazing here when you look at, you know, I was looking at preschool program and the preschool program was amazing. I mean, it was, it, it was the best program and I'm, you know, I'm looking, you know, I, I come from a pretty good background in education, you know, like I'm looking at Pasadena, I'm looking at all these other areas around me where, you know, where I'm going to take my child to school and I just see something you know, I see the academic rigor that I saw in the classes, and I also see this other piece, which is the one about relationships working together, caring for each other. And more and more, I think there's a lot of research, even though at that time you think like there's not a lot of, you don't need research to understand that having positive relationships is a key to success. And, and I know now there's a lot to back it up. But just in general, I think as Catholics, we know that that is something that you need. 
whenever you're going to go through any difficulty or celebrations or anything, building positive relationships is known to be a real a key to success. And so I saw that. I mean, you can only say that this, what, what does it say, obviously, for alumni to come back and, and share their stories about their kinder teacher or their eighth grade teacher, and then invite them uh, to their own weddings, invite them to their high school graduations, invite them to their college graduation. And then she knew there, she, there were, I felt like her kids were her grandkids, like the, her students' kids were like her own grandkids. Um, so I'm like, there's something special here uh, that I don't see anywhere else. It's just not a transaction of business of learning. It's way deeper than that. I saw the same thing from the kinder teacher. You know, she really, really cared about the students reading, but also cared about the students having uh, th this love of, of God and self and others, you know, taking care of God's creation, things like that. And, you know, for me, they became things like I would go to different schools and they would have the posted core values of the school. And it was great to see, but I actually, when you walk into resurrection school, you see them lived in the teachers there. And I wanted my kids to understand the difference between posting something and acting something, you know, that, they're, that they had a responsibility to the world to make it a better place since they were young. Um, and I think that that to me, just seeing the relationship between the, the teachers, the older teachers returning. Sometimes I think when I was uh, coming in as a, as a parent to meet the pre-K teacher at that time, and uh, you know, I just felt an automatic trust uh, when I saw the uh, uh, prior student bringing her own kids into the school for, you know, it's like, you don't come back to a school unless you, you know, you've seen your own success and you love it. There's something there that you value. And so, yeah, I think just, it was the both, the, the, the rigorous and academic, obviously appropriate for students that I knew it wasn't, you know, I wanted my child to, yes, play, social play was important, but I also wanted to learn. And I saw that. And so it was like a nice uh, combination of, again, that, uh, that the kids are, the, the alumni are coming back to bring their own children. And I saw it live there, the relationships, the long lasting relationships that teachers made with the students. And I wanted that for my children. Well, something that you said was just really key here. And I know given your, you know, your, your academic background, you, you, you say you don't need research to know this and it's true but there's lots of research to back it up. Positive relationships are the key to success is what uh, Principal Catalina just said, if you guys missed that. And it takes me back to Dr. Roberta Espinosa. I hope I'm gonna remember this correctly. She's now at LMU, but I think she might've been at Harvard at some point. She talks about pivotal moments and pivotal moments are, are basically defined as an adult in your life, usually an educator or mentor, something coach, who says something or identifies something or just believes in you. And so we all have that experience where um, uh, Dr. Angel Perez, he's now the president of, of NACAC, but he said that someone said to him when he was young, you're very smart young man. Have you ever thought about going to college? That kind of thing. And that is a moment in a, in a young person's life when a, an adult identifies something that maybe we perhaps didn't even know or see in ourselves. And I think that's what you're talking about is these are the kinds of relationships that our teachers in Catholic schools have. It's not just about teaching math. It's about teaching math and how was your weekend? How are things going? How's, you know, tu mama, tu papa, um, going to the quinceañeras as you, as you share, right? So that is really important. So. Maybe just talk a little bit more about that. What, what, where you see pivotal moments take place in your school? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that specific, like uh, the relationships built definitely by the, the teachers and the students, the fact that, uh, you know, our teachers, uh, you know, will sit with students during lunch if they're not feeling well, uh, take the time to get to know them. You know, I, I can tell you, a, I mean, not just pivotal for me, but pivotal for the for specific students. 
um, even during the pandemic, we had one of our teachers, my kinder teacher, talked, you know, and sharing with the students, uh, make, trying to make them feel comfortable and everything, obviously with this, this, this new challenge that we had. Um, the child said, you know, I'm hungry. And I remember my teacher call me, calling me back and just for her concern, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just she could just let it go. Like her student was hungry. It's like her own daughter was hungry. And I, and I think those are the kinds of, that is the kind of care that we see in our schools. And those are the pivotal moments where now she's like figuring out how she's gonna go shopping and how we're gonna make it so that this child's no longer hungry. And, and is you know, that kind of commitment and that she couldn't let it go, right? She couldn't just be like, well, I'm sure her mom's gonna feed her food. She wasn't gonna, she was like really worried and it, uh, you know, it was something that impacted her. Um, so things like that, you know, students being uh, listened, students being listened to, really being listened to. Um, I think that, and I say that because even as I became a principal, I found myself a lot of time multitasking and, you know, and then seeing the teachers listening to the students with just like that patience and that importance, like how many times in the world are we not seeing or not feeling listened to or we don't always listen because we're trying to go so fast. And that is so key to relationships. So to me, those were pivotal moments where I would see, and I'm sure it was for the children where they felt listened to, where the parents felt listened to, where the teachers were doing the listening and understanding and then solving with them. That, um, that definitely comes to mind. First of all, thank you for saying uh, something that maybe is a little bit vulnerable, even as humans, right? as a parent or as an administrator, uh, you know, when I was a principal, like I had 10 things on my mind. It takes a very special person uh, or type of person to be able to give undivided attention and be, and make that child feel that they're being heard. So you're, you're right. It's hard to do as an adult because we have so much going on, but uh, our students deserve that. And I think uh, the teachers in Catholic schools realize, realize that. Yeah. Now, there's a piece too that, um, two, two more pieces that I, I want to sort of address because you're um, a principal at a, at a, what we used to call the, the baby school, the younger school, the elementary, you know, middle, middle school. So uh, I would love for you to touch on how um, our Catholic schools in LA school district, LA Catholic school district, prepare students to be successful in the next level, which is high school. Um, and then the other piece too is the social justice piece. Um, I, I, just from my experience as a principal at a high, sc at high school couple, and working at a few high schools, I know what that looks like at a high school, but what is that, how does that social justice piece get blended and woven into the fabric um, at an elementary school? So let's, let's start with yeah. just Let me actually start with that. Social justice, yeah. So the in terms of social justice, so I mean, obviously, we're our schools uh, follow the Catholic social teachings. So I think when a school starts with that, there's just so much to, um, you know, because we think of not just ourselves but others. So in, in particular, in our school, our mission is preparing students to be college ready and to lead, and making sure that they do that because they know that it is their duty to learn and grow academically and socially. And so, and the reason that I'm, they will come together in a little bit as I explain a little more, but when it comes to social justice, students, we, since they're little, we explain to students and I think we act and we model that we give to others and that is our duty as Catholics and that we cannot be okay if others around us are not okay. And, and I, our kids, because they've been exposed, especially in our school through the, I don't know if you you're familiar with the Vernon plants that were polluting the airs in Boyle Heights, Vernon and neighborhoods. So, I mean, our students will go outside and smell, uh, you know, ugly smells that were coming from factories. So immediately, right, we're participating in protest with our parish uh, against the pollution of the Vernon uh, factory. And, you know, actually it got closed. So already there, right, there's a lot of buzz around the families, there's buzz around 
from the students because we participated, we created posters uh, for cleaner air in our community. Uh, same thing, we, ha we have, you know, homeless, uh, you know, we help the homeless. So we could do, we make little sandwiches for homeless, we, we care package and things like that. Um, I think especially now with the, uh, our, our students with all the social justice uh, uh, themes that have come up with the Me Too movement, with the Black Lives Matter movement, I think as Catholics, we were so much more prepared, I felt, to have that conversation with the students because we anchored everything in the social justice, that we care for human dignity, we care for others' uh, rights, uh, and that it's important that we feed our soul when we feed others and we do what's right for others. So a lot of students, especially when there were like Zoom calls that were invaded by somebody else, you know, and something happened, then we were like thinking about like, okay, how can we use social media? You know, middle school specifically, how do we use social me media, our own social media for turning in what may not be as healthy to a healthy less, you know, uh, look out for each other and improve our community, including our, our social media community. So I think that we do it with is a lot of times it's classroom projects, it's uh, often teacher led, sometimes school led. We also have students with uh, different abilities in our school. We're an inclusive school, a resurrection. So students get to see growing with them students that think differently and have different gifts than they do. Um, and so with that, they learn to be compassionate. They learn that others, not everybody learns the same way and that your way and your perspective is not the perspective of others. And so I think that because we, you know, we have religion every day in our school, our religion curriculum lets it's itself a lot to bringing these subjects in to the everyday life. Um, and our teachers, you know, they live with the students, they, they know what the students, because they talk to them and they listen to them, they know the things that are impacting them. Their lesson plans are always integrating all these dilemmas that students are engaging in outside. And sometimes they do role play. Um, but if a student is really the wants to do an autism week, well, let's plan it. They plan it with the student council and autism week is, you know, celebrated at resurrection. And those are little things, you know, because we have students that have autism at resurrection. So there's a lot that it happens naturally. And I, and I think that is actually what I noticed when I was first coming in, in the from the parent perspective into resurrection that there's just so much that is taken not for granted but is done so naturally because we are catholic that other schools don't do that we don't spend enough time sharing the uniqueness because to us it's just like you know and i and because even when i thought like oh well yeah we do all this other stuff it's just normal stuff but not everybody is doing it not everybody's teaching students that how important it is to not just do things for themselves but to do it for the better of the world in their community. I mean, that is something that is explicitly taught because you come to a Catholic school. Again, growing of your heart, not just the mind. Yeah, I mean, but it goes back to what you said that uh, you, know, you can have a, a vision or a mission or a value statement in the front office. You can list what the values are, but posting it, you said, is different than acting it, doing it. And the act of doing action uh is is what the social justice piece is all about so yeah i love that you got out there with protests and you know oh yeah i can't that's imagine that's like learning how to protest when i'm eight years old that's super cool <laughs> We also have a pastor, I think, our relationship with our parish, right, which again, not, it's not typical of, of many public schools. We automatically become part of a bigger community. And so our parish pastor, John, uh, Father John Moretta, um, is just very active in the community. And so kind of by default, whatever the parish is being active in, the school becomes active in. Oh, so good. So then speak to the point about the academics for those, uh, because we didn't speak to in our series, we haven't really spoken to um, a high school a leader, um, talk to, Anne Marie Silva, but um, at the elementary school level. So, can you just share, as a principal, what is your vision, or how do you see the role of transition transition from your school to the four year uh, high school, traditional high school? So, my school in particular uh, works with a lot of low income families, and so a lot of the times. Uh, it, Unfortunately, our families do come with a lot of academic gaps. So we work 
two different ways uh, with that. And I'll, and I'll speak a little bit of the general trend that I see in our Catholic school. So one, we're always monitoring, obviously, the students' growth spiritually, because that's what makes us special about Catholic school. And at the same way, we want to make sure that the students are going to be leaders in the community. And for that, they need to be able to read, write, and, you know, be critical thinkers. Uh, and so we are also monitoring. We have ways to monitor, uh, I think, more traditionally with our assessments a minimum three times a year that are, you know, system-wide, how students are doing in both like math and, and reading, which is typical of most schools. So we, we're looking at the, that data and we are very uh, lucky in that we can see not only whether students are growing, how they're growing compared to their peers, but also if how if they're going to be proficient by the time that they finish our, in eighth grade in our school. And so that becomes to us very important. Now, in our school specifically, we do a lot of goal setting uh, so that we, in the beginning of the year, as soon as the students take their first assessment, we look at, okay, where, how are we doing? How far are you from being proficient? Uh, or, you know, making sure that they end up, up at level or above level by the time that they're in eighth grade. Um, and then the, the teacher has the goal for the class. The student has a goal that they create and the parent has a goal to support the student. So it's very, again, back to those relationships, very collaborative because this idea that it really takes a village to raise the child, both academically and spiritually, really happens at Catholic schools. And so we're setting goals, we're monitoring those goals. So that's one way, but we also, you know, our teachers are going through uh, professional development around intervention. Our teachers are, uh, you know, really looking at adaptive programs that really reaches students where they are and it's going to make sure that they grow. Um, I think that the fact that we actually have academic data to review and look at uh, formally and informally, I think because as teachers have their own assessment also in their classroom, is something that then we use evidence to make sure that the students are making adequate progress. So when they're not making adequate progress, we have times to make sure and we intervene instead of waiting uh, when it's too late. And often we, if we get students, again, different able students, right, because we're, we're an inclusive system, um, that means that sometimes our students, we know that they may get to eighth grade and, and maybe there's still a, a gap, right? Our biggest, uh, our biggest aim when we see students of all different abilities is that we teach them to be learners. And I think there's, people say that all the time, but that is actually a little harder said than done. Meaning, do, students, do the students know how to study? Do the students know how to, uh, when they see something that is super difficult and they're about to shut down, do they know how to get that growth mindset and pull through and persevere? And those are things that are explicitly discussed in our schools. Why? Because, and I can tell you as an educator, I learned how to struggle with work and I learned how to work hard. And when I went to that boarding school, I was not up to par with my peers. I had gas, but I knew how to work hard and I knew how not to give up. And I had my faith backing me up in every prayer at night and right before a test. And, and I just didn't, I just knew that I couldn't give up because I had something that was, that was really like embedded in me, right? This hard work, the perseverance, that not giving up because yes, even though it may be hard for me and that doesn't come easy, I'm still gonna know how to handle it. And I can tell you that that has been very, um, worked a lot for us, especially in our Catholic schools who are using programs that are adaptive because the programs are pushing students at their level. So even a student that is advanced are getting, you know, most, most of the time students are advanced, you know, they still want to learn more. And a lot of times in schools, they are advanced and they kind of stay because the, the rest of the class may or may not be ready for them. Well, in our schools, there's programs where students can continue to grow even if they're advanced. And so the student that is advanced learns how to persevere too. It, the, everything's not gonna come easier. There's gonna be a level where they're gonna be challenged and they're gonna learn how to work around that challenge. And so this, I, this growth mindset, the persevering piece and the hard work piece, I think that is what better prepares our students uh, to then continue that learning, the side, like side, continuous process of learning when they go to high school so that if things get hard, they still know how to get up, you know, live above it and persevere and not let it like really put them down. That at the end of the day, knowing how to learn, knowing how to critically think and knowing how to problem solve things that are coming their way and obstacles is going to really prepare them, not just for high school, but for life. Right, right. And you know, what you're 
what you're talking, I love the whole growth mindset talk that you're, you're speaking of. And what you're also speaking of is really about grit. How do you yeah. teach grit? How do you, you know, I'm, I'm hanging on, you know, with my fingernails, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to you know, keep fighting. And that prepares them for the obstacles or challenges they may face at high school, but also in, uh, beyond uh, into college. So you're right. You're right. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. So my uh, last question for you is just a, a question I ask everybody because um, my book is called Tips, Tales, and Truth. So I always say, do you have one tip or one truth? Because you've shared a lot of tales already, but is there one tip or one truth that you would want parents to know about, um, you know, what it means to be a teacher and educator in the Catholic school system? So I'll say that the truth, the truth of what it makes a teacher special in a Catholic school system is that the teacher will care about your child in more than the traditional academic way. That your child will be seen as a human developing for life and that their development of their heart is just as important as their development of their mind. Beautiful, beautiful. Ah, okay. All right, well, hold tight with us. <clears throat> I'm gonna wrap up right now. Okay. And then we'll wave goodbye, but that is wonderful. Oh my goodness. Okay, now, talking with Catalina, does that not make you wanna just run right to your local Catholic school and say, sign me up? Yeah, we hope that every Catholic school has a principal just like Catalina. So here's what, um, here's my takeaway. You've heard the tips and some tales and even Catalina's truth. Here's what I took away today. Here's the truth I leave with. I heard the word community multiple, multiple times. So community in our Catholic school system is literally the surrounding community, the local community, right? She talked about getting involved with the local protests and the local area. So the surrounding local community. There's also the family community. Coming into a Catholic school, you're going to be surrounded and loved up just by your peers, the, the community of families that make up an institution, a Catholic school. There's also the teacher community, and that bleeds out and pours over the love for they have for each other and in their school, bleeds out and over into abundance for your, for your child. There's a Catholic community, whether you are Catholic, or you're a Catholic family or a non-Catholic family, I have found the Catholic schools to be very welcoming, very embracing in this, again, warmth and love and social justice and just wanting to, for everyone to be part of the community. There's also the piece there that I mentioned, social justice is being a part of a national and global community. I love what Principal Kathleen has said about we teach students that we can't be okay if someone else, our neighbor, is not okay. So it's being part of that national and global community. And really last but not least, at the end of the day, what you're looking for for your child is a community of supporters and believers because that is ultimately the key to success, having positive relationships with key adults in your life. That success will lead to a happy future. So that's all I have for you today my dreamers. Thank you so much for listening and uh, viewing and really just joining the conversation. We know you have a full and busy plate. So thank you for spending your time with us today. If this episode has in any way fueled your confidence or helped build your dreams, please share this episode with three people in the next 30 minutes. And if you're feeling a little extra loving today, hit subscribe so you don't miss another, another ep episode. It helps other folks find uh, find and get started on their journey to Destination University. That's all we have for you today, my dreamers. Be sure to tune in next time. Until then, have a happy and sunny day. Bye for now.